I actually, I believe that we're actually in a recession now, and we've probably been in a recession for several quarters. Um, and let me just add this. If it were not for deficit spending, we would have been in a recession for, I mean, we would, have, we would, and I'm talking about in the United States, but of course that's, you know, that will spread out to the, the entire Western world. But if it wasn't for deficit spending, we would have been in a recession or negative growth for five years, 10 years or more. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JRM Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. Thank you so much for joining us here where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. And we have a fantastic conversation lined up for you today. I know so because I already watched it. And uh, to be quite honest, I'm re-recording a lot of my questions and intro here as well because I managed to record the interview with our guest, Bill Holter, without my microphone or without my audio. My guests could hear me but the audio track was not recorded. So apologies for that, but uh, I'm doing my best to re-record my questions. The content and the insights Bill Holter provides are exceptional anyway. So that's uh, that's all that matters, right? Leave a comment, leave a like, and if you haven't done so, I'd tremendously appreciate a subscription to this channel. It helps us bring guests on like Bill Holter and many, many others. Now, let me introduce Bill Holter. Thank you for having me, Kai. Absolutely. Great to have you on, Bill. And uh, let, let, let's jump right in. One question I always ask my guests is, how do you currently rank the state of the economy? How are we doing? How are things looking? Uh, well, first off, if you look at uh, the official numbers, if you read mainstream, we've got a strong economy. Um, if, you look, if, if you look at uh, uh, anecdotal evidence versus official numbers, you'll see that things aren't that way. Um, I think really the most important thing to do is to look at where interest rates are right now. And I think the most important rate is the 10 year treasury because a lot of the, a lot of credit is based off of that. And I mean, we've gone now uh, on the 10 year treasury from what, two, two and a half years ago, we were 0.6 of a percent. And the last I looked, uh, Rates were 499. So this is a huge move upwards. Uh, it's what 4.4 percentage points higher. So I mean, if we were looking at a base of six percent and we're up to 10.4, it would still be an oh my god moment. But going from 0.6 to five percent, that 4.4 percent is that's a it's an astronomical move. And if you know anything about bonds, you'll know that zero coupon treasuries are the most volatile. The higher the coupon, the less the volatility, the lower the coupon, the more the volatility. And I'm just going to tell you, because the entire world runs on credit, the world has become a zero coupon bond. And the higher interest rates has really, has literally gutted uh, the financial system. It's gutted the foundation to the system because the foundation is based on credit. Thanks for that intro there, Bill. But uh, w what are some of the indicators you're looking at right now? I think the biggest indicator is just look at real estate, uh, whether it be homes, uh, commercial real estate. Those markets have pretty much seized up. Uh, they seized up because credit availability is much lower now than it was two years ago. Uh, banks across the board or lenders across the board have tightened their standards. And then on top of that, I mean, if you're a commercial real estate entity that has debt that's coming due now and you're refinancing at current rates, all of the assumptions that you've had for the past, what, five years, eight years or more, those are out the window because what worked before when you had uh, the 10-year treasury at 2 or 3%, doesn't it no longer works at five percent i mean look at for instance use a, a hotel for existing for example uh the occupancy level to make the debt service and even if the occupancy levels don't decline because the debt service has gone so much higher that level of occupancy doesn't turn a profit in in you know today's new higher rates so, I mean, it's the higher rates have, have changed the equation across the board. And of course, 
I mean, just look at the stock market. You look at uh, PE ratios, they're a comparison to interest rates. And, you know, PE ratios where they are right now are ridiculous. Their PEs are, are trading like the 10 years at 2%. And the 10 years not at 2%, it's at 5 Bill, we also got some housing data this this week uh, out of the government here. And uh, housing starts have jumped tremendously as well. How does that all fit together? Uh, the housing starts jumping. Uh, first off, I would question if that's even real. I mean, you literally have to question if anything's real today, uh, whether they be government statistics, you know, what you read on Facebook or Twitter or or hear from mainstream media. Uh, the only thing I can say is if if housing starts did truly jump, it's because there was money available to do it. And that's what builders do. Builders have money to build. It doesn't matter what's going on around them or what's going on in the world. So, Bill, what you're pretty much saying is that pretty much dumping money on the problem, meaning the recession has sort of co caused that delay. Uh, do you think we'll still see a recession? Are we already in a recession? Like, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, myself, I actually I believe that we're actually in a recession now, and we've probably been in a recession for several quarters. Um, and let me just add this. If it were not for deficit spending, we would have been in a recession for, I mean, we would have, we would, and I'm talking about in the United States, but of course that's, you know, that will spread out to the, the entire Western world. But if it wasn't for deficit spending, we would have been in a recession or negative growth for five years, 10 years or more. I mean, just think about how much the additional, you know, trillion dollars per year plus in deficits adds to the bottom line. I mean, if, if we're, if they say we're growing at one or 2%, but yet the deficit's 3% of the economy or 4%, what's the reality? The, the reality is that uh, there was negative growth minus, you know, sans the, the, uh, the deficit spending. So throwing money at the problem bill is really just saving the U S right now. Well, that's exactly what it is. They, they create, um, money is created by the creation of debt. Um, money is also created. Well, money was created after COVID. Look at all the COVID payments and how was that paid? That was paid for, uh, by higher deficits. And it's interesting. Uh, once the, uh, the budget fight was over back in what early September sometime, the treasury borrowed another $700 billion dollars in 20 days. So, I mean, that's $700 billion of, if you want to call it GDP, conjured up out of thin air and spent and used within a 20-day period of time. But the problem is the math. Yeah, the problem is the math doesn't work now. At $33 trillion on books debt, and there's plus, you know, there's over $200 trillion in obligations altogether. But if you look at $33 trillion of on books debt and then place 5% on that, you're over a, a trillion and a half per year in just interest expense alone. So the math at this point no longer works. You can't continue uh, deficit spending because deficits add to the pile, and now the pile of debt is too big to service. Debt service payments are a huge issue. We've often discussed here on the channel in the past, and uh, as as you said, it's going to get at, it's going to hit one point five trillion dollars at some point. I think we just broke through one trillion here, probably way over that already in annual debt service payments. So the question is, when does it get political? When does it get noticed? How much longer can the politicians sweep that issue under the rug, Bill? Well, that's an easy answer. The answer to that is today. The reason I say today, the Wall Street Journal came out with an article talking exactly about this, talking about uh, the interest expense, the debt service required to service the debt. So that political ball has been thrown on the court as of today via the Wall Street Journal. Now that that is coming out, like, is there anything they can do to solve the problem at all? Like, what are we looking at? What's possible? What are some possible solutions, if any? Um, at this point, as uh, we meant, I mentioned to you before we started recording, the cake is already baked. It's already done. The math, the math cannot be reversed. 
There's nothing the Fed can do. There's nothing the Treasury can do. There's nothing anybody can do to change the outcome. Can they delay the outcome a little bit? Possibly. But it doesn't matter because the math does not work. So, Bill, in in your point of from your point of view, like how does this play out? Like, what is the end game? Like, what is the end game scenario here? What are we looking at? What are we facing? Well, yeah, this is the end game. Debt is gone. Debt has gone parabolic, and the ability to service that debt, in other words, tax revenues, have not gone parabolic. They, they're you know barely growing. Um, if you go back just three years ago, and for the previous 30 years before that, the debt service amount traded generally between 350 billion and 500 billion per year. And that illusion that the debt service was not rising was able to be done by lowering interest rates continually. The debt went up, the interest rates went down, so the debt service stayed the same for roughly, uh, like I said, roughly 30 years, 30, 30 plus years. That illusion basically stopped once interest rates started rising. And the problem is those rates started rising from 0%. And again, uh, coming off of a zero interest rate for rates to go up 1%, 2%, at this point, over four percentage points, because they're coming off of zero, it's it's completely devastating. It's not like going from five percent to ten percent. Zero percent to five percent is is a it's it's a shock. It, it will completely shut the system down. If you go back just what six months ago, you had four major banks all fail within what two weeks or three weeks time, and the assets of those four banks were greater than all the banks that went under back in 2008, 2009. So the problem's already bigger than it was back then. And they did get it shoved under the rug, but that's when rates were three and a quarter percent. Now they're five. And we've not even talked about, we've, we've not even talked about derivatives. All derivatives are issued. Every derivative when it's issued is issued with an interest rate assumption. And how many derivatives you think have been issued in the last six, seven, 10 plus years, you know, since the 2008, 2009 episode, how many derivatives have been issued in, in dollar terms or Euro terms or yen terms? How many uh, derivatives have been issued with basically a half a percent or 1% or 2% assumption? And now we're at five. So it's off. It's, it's, it's knocking uh, the derivative sector off center. And that's a two, plus quadrillion dollar market on top of 400 yeah on top of 400 trillion in debt so so what you're saying there's really no solution out there to solve our massive debt issue there is no solution and that's why i say this cake is already baked you can't unbake it you can't change the, the shape of it the cake is already baked there is no solution because the math the math cannot be negated the debt service cannot be, uh, the debt can no longer be serviced. And the debt certainly cannot be repaid in current uh, currency terms. So is the only solution really just the default here? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, look at, for instance, just look at the BRICS. I mean, there's going to be an East versus West reset. There's no question about that. Um and because all fiat currencies are debt or credit based, once the debt in the West begins to collapse, and it is the debt is already starting to collapse. Um, and I mean, oh, just looking at the interest rates going up and the bond prices going down, the 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 foundation itself is thinner and thinner. So when the when the debt collapses that will ultimately collapse the currencies themselves because they are debt-based. And that's why you want to own gold. That's why you want to own silver because those are the only two monies that cannot bankrupt in a world that's defaulting. 
Bill, since you brought up uh, China and the BRICS here as well, let's let's talk about southern de- uh, southern debt as well, because a lot of the U.S. debt is held by southern nations like China, for instance, and they've been a seller for years now. Uh, not just uh, not just started selling yesterday. How does that impact everything? And is that just added fuel or adding fuel to the collapse or the the fire? <laughs> I was going to say the collapsing fire, just adding fuel to the fire. China being a seller, China is not the only seller. It looks like pretty much all central banks and sovereigns over the last six months to a year have been net sellers. So the question is, who is going to finance our deficits? And the only answer could could possibly be the Federal Reserve itself. So I think you're going to see the Federal Reserve's balance sheet explode because they're going to be forced to buy not only new treasury debt, but also debt that's being sold by foreigners. I mean, you could have, uh, you know, China could, could, for some geopolitical reason, dump their treasuries. Who's going to buy a trillion dollars worth of treasuries? Who, what entity out there has the ability to do that? There is none. So, yeah, it's it's... That, without a doubt, uh, is a problem. One thing we've worked out with Michael Howell in a recent discussion here on this channel is liquidity that the U.S. is sort of the only destination for a lot of the money worldwide because it's the only liquid banking system or banking system that has enough liquidity that uh, China, for example, can park its foreign reserves and there's no other country that can facilitate that. That's assuming there is a banking system. One thing I want I do want to say about, about China, and I said this many years ago, um, China has a debt problem themselves. I mean, they're they're sitting on top of a 300 plus percent uh, debt to GDP ratio. The difference between what China has done and the U.S. at what are we now 125 or 130 percent debt to GDP? We've borrowed money and we spent it. We ate our seed corn. Whereas China, what did they do? They built cities. They built railways, they built air airports, they built infrastructure. And if the debt collapses, they'll just walk away and say, so what? We're left with stuff that's built on the ground. What are you left with? And what we're left with is a bunch of infrastructure that is actually collapsing because it hasn't been uh, it hasn't been maintained for the last 50 to 100 years. Bill, let's uh, switch gears here a little. Let's take a look how gold has been performing in, in recent week, actually. It's been uh, rallying from uh, 1810. It's bounced off that level three times already. I'm not a technical analyst, as everybody knows here on this channel, but it's quite significant that it has bounced off that level three times now. W- what do you make of that, and uh, what is driving the current price rally, given you know still a very strong U.S. dollar and uh, uh, surging bond yields? Um, I don't know the significance of 1810, uh, but I mean, there there could be significance to uh, foreign central banks and foreign sovereign treasuries. If you look over the last year or so, they've turned net buyers, you know, fairly strong net buyers. And, you know, typically, typically central banks, uh, I mean, all central banks are going to do what's, what's best for them. And I think central banks are looking at uh, what we've just talked about, the the mathematics of U.S. sovereign debt and the ability to service it with dollars, I think they're looking at that and saying, well, the U.S. is going to have to seriously debase the dollar in order to keep any sort of game going. So how how do how do central banks insulate themselves from a, a downturn slash collapse of the Western financial system, they buy gold. And again, central banks understand that dollars are fiat. Gold is not fiat. Gold has no liability. And gold is something they can hold on their balance sheet and know that it's still going to be there tomorrow morning. You know, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. Um, and with Western currencies, declining in value, uh, you know, the, the gold will serve its purpose to support their balance sheets. And you mentioned, you did mention about uh, the strong dollar. Understand that when you're talking about a strong dollar, you're talking about the USDX. So, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the dollar versus euros. That's the dollar versus yen versus British pounds versus Canadian dollars 
versus uh, Chinese yuan. It's paper versus paper. So, so the dollar has gotten stronger versus other currencies. But what what has happened to the dollar versus a day of a man's labor, or versus a cup of coffee, or versus any real good? We have inflation. That is, the dollar is debasing, and if the dollar is strong on the USDX, it means that other foreign currencies are debasing even worse. So what I'm describing is inflation. And that's the way you measure a dollar or you measure a currency is is versus what will it buy, not versus other crappy currencies. Bill, give, given that backdrop of collapsing dollar, like where, where do you think gold is headed? Like how does that fit into a sort of the equation and how, how is gold maybe part of a solution? Um, let me be clear. I believe the Western financial system is in the process of collapsing. Uh, I don't think anyone can forecast a price for gold because you, first off, you have no idea how much more debt the U.S. is going to pile on. Secondly, nobody knows. Uh, there's not been an audit of Fort Knox, West Point, et cetera, since I think 1956. So, there's, there's no way to know exactly how much gold the U.S. even has. And if you do the math, if you do the math, if the U.S. was required uh, to pay its debt with gold ounces that we supposedly have, the number would be over $125,000 an ounce. And in a, in a collapsed system, and we find out, God forbid, the U.S. does not have the gold that we say we have, Pick a number, 500,000, a million, 10 million, who knows? And I mean, you could laugh at it all day long, but look at Weimar Germany. Gold went from 200 Reichmarks to what was the number? 2.7 trillion Reichmarks. Uh, the bottom line is gold is real money. It's gold and silver are the only real money on the planet. Everything else is currency. Bill, something I've learned actually on this channel doing interviews is that um gold and silver are actually not legal tender in the U.S., certain states, and uh, I'm not sure if it's federal or just certain states, but uh, the point is that small businesses are not required to accept uh, gold and silver as they are not supposed to be burdened with having to figure out what a gram of gold, for example, is worth on a daily basis. So I can't even go into a Walmart and pay, uh, let's say, a television set with uh, an ounce of gold, for example. Uh, Walmart's not required to take anything. Walmart will take what they want. I mean, even though it says on your on your dollar bill, uh, legal for all debts, public and private, there are many uh, businesses that refuse to pay cash. So, I mean, in that instance, cash is not currency either. Gold is money. You're confusing money with currency. And I, I guarantee you, when when times get really, really bad, your gold and your silver will spend with another counterparty. And at that point, it won't matter what Walmart will uh, will accept because the Walmart shelves, well, no, Walmart shelves, the grocery store shelves, all shelves are going to be empty. Everything runs on credit. Without credit, there's not going to be any products to buy. Bill, something I really wanted to circle back to here is that something you've mentioned earlier is it's a matter of credit and banks sort of tightening credit. How does that affect the economy, in particular small businesses that uh, even some bakers, for example, have to borrow money just to keep their working capital going? Yeah, just listen to what the banks themselves are saying. They are tightening credit standards. Um, I just a couple of days ago spoke with a, a guy who owns hotels in five different states, and he said one one of the, his hotels, uh, the the bank, even though there's, probably, I think he said there was like over 80% equity in the project. So it was only 20% debt. And they called the note thinking he wasn't going to be able to have the, the cash to come up and, uh, and pay the note and basically take his equity. He did come up with the cash, but... My my point being is banks themselves are saying that they are tightening credit standards 
they're tightening uh, who and how much they're going to lend. And it, it, it happens every, I mean, look at every financial crisis we've had going back to, uh, and I'm going to say going back to 1973, the, the big credit problem back then were the super tankers. They called all the loans on the super tankers. Back in 82, they were calling loans. 80, 1987, they were calling loans. 2000, 2008, 2009, the banks always overlend and lend money too easily during the good times. And then when times get tough, they get too tight and they exacerbate the problem. And that's where we are now. Banks are, and they admit themselves that they have tightened credit standards dramatically. Not to mention higher interest rates make it very difficult for uh, a project to be profitable when rates have quintupled in two years time. Bill, to sort of start putting a, a bow around our discussion here, it, how do you see things playing out in a matter of timing as well? Because to me, it feels like we're running into this wedge pattern or it feels like a, a bunch of pots boiling water on the stove with a lid to blow off. Like, what are we looking at? Like, when are things going to boil over here? Yeah, I think you're you're talking about the metals on a on a technical basis. Yeah, there's there's fifty or a hundred different pots, and every single one of them is boiling. The question is, which pot does the top blow off of first? And once you have you know one one area that blows up, it will blow up everything because everything is interconnected today. I mean, there's there's you know you could go back fifty years ago and you could have a regional crisis. There's no such thing as a regional crisis any longer because the world is so uh, globalized, whether it comes to finance or uh, trade or the real economy, everything is globalized. So, you know, you're asking me for a timeline. I personally think this is it right here. We're watching it unravel. Uh, I, I don't know how the, the situation in, in Israel is going to work out. Uh, but all I can say is if it heats up, you know, what does that do to oil? We, do we really need an oil shock right now where uh, the not just price-wise exploding higher in price, but the supply itself being cut off as far as, you know, oil coming, oil coming out of the Arab countries, the Strait of Hormuz. I mean, the, you can have a problem with, uh, with shipping routes. Yeah, we've just seen uh, an Evergrande ship here block the Suez Canal, and that completely uh, set up the supply chains worldwide as well. You now that that was just one straight, but uh, imagine that on a scale uh, where where tankers don't, it, it could get to the point where tankers won't even uh, head out to sea because no insurance company will insure them. Bill, let's uh, wrap up this discussion here with a bit of an unfair question, obviously. But uh, where do you see gold headed this year by the end of the year? Well, it will end higher, and I believe probably much higher. I mean, if we have a, a financial meltdown between now and year end, yes, in the past we've seen financial meltdowns where uh, you saw the price of gold and silver get hit. That was orchestrated by, by selling naked contracts. This time around, uh, you get a meltdown like we had back in 2008, 2009, which this time will be a loss of control, and that loss of, of control will include a failure to deliver by COMEX and LBMA. So we get a failure to deliver, all bets are off as far as price. I mean, you could be you look at, that, you know, $5,000 could be a stupid low price. Uh, just look at the movie Rollover. What, what was the, the famous line in there? 2,000 an ounce will be cheap by tomorrow morning. And that's when gold was, what, uh, 400, 500 bucks an ounce. Bill, I really appreciate the clarity here and uh, being straight with us. Thanks for clarifying a few things uh, on the markets and where things are headed. Where can we find more of you? How, how can we get a hold of you, Bill? Um, you can go to my website. Uh, it's a new site uh, started back in March, I guess, uh, BillHolter.com. Uh, if you have questions for me uh, directly, you can contact my business email. It's B. Holter at hotmail.com. 
Fantastic, Bill. Thank you so much for joining us and to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, apologies for the technical difficulties. I still hope you enjoyed this conversation with Bill Holter. If you haven't done so, we, despite the technical difficulties, appreciate a subscription to this channel. Leave a comment, leave a like. We do want to hear from you. And uh, are we going to see each other soon in New Orleans or at the Deutsche Goldmesse in Frankfurt? I've left, uh, I've left some links down below. So maybe we can meet up in New Orleans uh, early November. I'll be out there for a week. So make sure to reach out. Uh, you can direct message me on, on Twitter. You can uh, leave a comment. I'll reach out to you. It'd be great to catch up. Would love to hear from you. And if you're Europe-based, why don't you join us in Frankfurt at the Deutsche Goldmesse, November 24th and 25th. If you're a qualified investor, you're free to register uh, at deutschegoldmesse.com or germangoldshow.com. We got the, the English uh, domain as well. So make sure to uh, follow us there. Join us. You can see the companies presenting the keynotes, which are fantastic and uh, lots, lots more. So thank you so much for that and uh, stay tuned for more.